We are proud to announce the 2019 Palisade Global Hard Asset Conference, taking place on Jackal Island from May 16th to May 20th. Speakers confirmed include one of the most successful venture capital fund managers within the resource space, Marin Katusa. Legendary mining investor Paul Matizek, former hedge fund manager Mike Alkin, and CEO at US Global Investors, Frank Holmes. All these guests, plus many more to be announced. Sign up now for more details and to be included in our special guest list. Join us in Jackal Island. Become part of a growing number of investors who are ready to take advantage of a coming resource boom. Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. I am your guest host, Karema Mutlu, and on today's show, we have the president of House Mountain Partners and a well-known commentator on the battery metal space, Chris Berry. How are you today, Chris? I'm well, Karem. Thank you for having me on. No problem. Let's begin by talking about the lithium market. Sentiment has certainly changed from the euphoria of, say, two or three years ago. 2018 was perhaps a consolidation period for the space in general, with most investors adopting a wait-and-see approach. So how do you see the lithium market today? And because of the weakness we've had, is that healthy for the space going forward? Yeah, I think, you know, you raise a lot of good points in your question. Um, I sort of look at 18, uh, 2018 as a, as a reset year, for sure, certainly in terms of um, lithium equity valuations. I mean, uh, there were a couple of things that took the market by surprise, predominantly uh, the, the unforeseen addition of low quality brine uh, in China, which really collapsed the inside China price, not the longer term contract price. But I think that gave investors um, pause. It gave them a chance to say, hey, wait a second, how, you know, is this another story where the Chinese are just going to come in and flood the market and all of a sudden prices are going to mean revert? That certainly happened inside China, but you know, I think when you take a step back and you look at the broader lithium demand picture out to, you know, let's say 2027, 2028, out over the next 10 years, you know, the demand side of this story has really only gotten stronger. Um, and so, you know, when I look at lithium today, I mean, yes, all of the equities are beaten, beaten down, whether or not you look at majors like Albemarle or SQM or, or some of the juniors. But again, I just really haven't seen any change in the overall demand dynamic. If anything, it continues to get stronger. So, you know, I, I focused on this energy metal space for the last nine years and, and been involved in commodities in various capacities longer than that. And I don't think I've ever seen a bigger disconnect um, for any commodity investment opportunity than I have with lithium, where, you know, people, th there is a, a group out there, I guess you could call it, that is expecting oversupply and, and lower prices. But again, that just does not show up when you speak with people along the uh, supply chain with respect to demand. So, you know, nobody expected this, the China supply ad from last year that really, again, took it by surprise. But the demand side overall, is uh, really, really very strong and, of course, led by China and other further, I guess, downstream players. Very good. So over the next few years, do you see perhaps more M&A activity within the lithium space? And if that does come to fruition, what does this mean for the supply chain going forward? I do, I do think one of the challenges right now in terms of understanding lithium is that uh, you know, there, there are a lot of balls in the air, so to speak, with respect to the supply chain. It's still being built out. It's still consolidating. You know, the lithium business overall has never seen this much, this much interest or this much need for investment um, to the point where, you know, lithium demand is growing at about 15 to 20 percent per year right now. And depending upon who you speak with in the space, that's probably going to continue for the next, you know, five to seven to 10 years. So, you know, M&A usually happens uh, either at the bottom of the cycle or at the top of the cycle. And when I look at lithium, I sort of say, gosh, I feel like, you know, we're, we're at the end of the beginning, to quote uh, Winston Churchill or paraphrase Winston Churchill. And so, you know, there has been some M&A. Obviously, uh, most of it um, has been downstream. I mean, you've seen joint ventures, for example, with Toyota and Panasonic getting together to produce EV batteries, CATL and Geely. A, um, a Chinese automotive producer, a couple of examples. But of course, you know, on the, um, I guess, upstream portion, you've seen some, some consolidation as well. 
Albemarle is, I think, the most recent example, spending a little over a billion dollars for 50 percent of the mineral resources Wagena deposits. So, you know, kind of to circle back and I think address your question directly, you know, M&A, I think it really either happens more, more often at the bottom or the top of the cycle. And, you know, since I think this this run, if you will, has further to go, I think that if there is any consolidation, it'll probably be in the junior space where obviously it's difficult to raise funds right now in this macro environment. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily think you'd see a lot of consolidation with the bigger guys because they're actually looking at more organic growth when you look at the likes of SQM or Albemarle or even Livent for that matter. They're talking about spending literally billions of dollars to maintain their market share in a, and again, a lithium business that's growing at 15 to 20 percent per year. Let's move on to cobalt. The general consensus is that the overall increasing demand for batteries uh, for electric vehicles is going to continue, yet less cobalt will be needed for them going forward due to possible changes in battery chemistries over the next few years. Do you see a potential situation for cobalt to not be needed as the technology improves for the batteries, or is this something that investors today don't need to concern themselves with? Well, I think that cobalt, you know, given given the need for energy density in a battery, okay, uh, cobalt will always be needed. The question that I think that everyone is struggling with, whether or not you're a battery scientist or a chemist or an individual investor, is just how much cobalt per battery will be needed and what is ultimately the winning chemistry, okay? You know, you mentioned in your question how uh, cathode chemistry in particular is evolving and Every battery manufacturer, cathode manufacturer around the world that I'm speaking with is working on what I'll say cathode, or I should say cobalt light cathodes. Um, and that has everything to do with minimizing exposure to the DRC and, of course, minimizing the overall cost of the cathode and lowering battery costs overall. So, of course, minimizing cobalt means increasing nickel. So you hear a lot these days about nickel heavy cathodes, and that's the direction that um, I think the, the industry is heading. So, you know, we are seeing an accelerated push towards nickel manganese cobalt 811. A lot of the listeners will be familiar with that. That's just the, the portion of nickel manganese and cobalt in the cathode. And I think you're also going to start to see a renewed focus or maybe a, a new focus on battery recycling. Okay. Uh, if you look at, for example, benchmark mineral intelligence, you know, their estimates are talking about literally almost one and a half terawatts of battery capacity coming on stream by around 2028. And I may have those, you know, that's kind of a ballpark for those numbers. They may not be exact, but nevertheless, my point is you're about to see an enormous amount of battery capacity um, hit the market over the next 10 to 15 years. And so I think recycling in particular is going to become a, a bigger factor there again really led by the need to minimize cobalt's use and also minimize the focus on the DRC as a cobalt source, all right? Uh, with respect to market share or market structure, I should say, of cobalt, you know, look, as an investor, it's very difficult to play. We all know that. You have Glencore and you have China Molybdenum, and they really, you know, are the lion's share of, of production in the cobalt market. Um, and that looks to me like it's only getting stronger. Actually, it was just last week that China Molybdenum um, upped their stake in their the Tenki Fukurumi mine that they uh, partially own in the DRC to 80%. They spent about $1.14 billion to do that. So you kind of see the big guys getting bigger. And, you know, in an environment where the cobalt price is, is well off its highs, it was hit a high of about $93,000 a ton. Uh, in March of, of 2018, that's the LME metal price. You know, today we're closer to maybe $35,000 a ton. So the price has been falling. It's a great opportunity, obviously, for the major producers, but it does make it difficult for, you know, near-term production stories or even junior miners involved in cobalt to, um, to raise, you know, the requisite financing to get in the game. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not a need for them. Clearly, there is. And you've seen a huge focus on deposits in Australia, Canada, other parts of the world, again, to try to minimize the focus on the DRC and maybe thin out some of this uh, market concentration. But it's going to take a fair amount of time to do that. So, again, pretty positive on cobalt. I think it's, you know, it's paradoxical, but you're looking at a situation where 
just based on kind of consensus demand and, and EV penetration out over the next 10 years, cobalt demand is going to increase by two to two and a half times, okay, from today. And that's for the battery business, obviously, in chemical form. But you've seen declining prices. And so the question is, well, geez, if we can sort of extrapolate all of this demand going forward, why is the price falling? And it has everything to do with market structure and, and I think looming supply. But longer term, um, again, I do think that looking at those deposits outside of the DRC, you know, from the junior mining perspective is probably what you want to do. But it's going to be it's going to be a long, long, long slog. Let's get your thoughts on the vanadium market, Chris. So how does vanadium look to you at the moment? The recent sell-off perhaps reminds me of what lithium went through last year. That is a healthy pullback as the demand story continues to improve. What are your thoughts? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a pretty apt description. You know, I think that I've been following uh, the vanadium market um, across all, all sectors, you know, not just steel, but also looking in the battery space, following following it, I should say, since about 2012. And, you know, one of the things that's always concerned me is I've heard this narrative of China, you know, demanding that vanadium is used in, in rebar, hearing that since about 2012. Now, you know, it's kind of a cautionary tale, but you hear, because you hear it every year and it never really seems to go into effect. It looks fortunately like that has finally changed. And that was, I think, partially the reason for the spike in uh, vanadium pricing and vanadium demand. And so, you know, I think what you're seeing in the vanadium space right now is is a little bit of mean reversion. I mean, I think the excitement is over, the dust has settled. It does look like, you know, you've seen mine closures coupled with the Chinese finally getting serious about implementing these, uh, I guess, demands, if you will, around stronger steel and stronger rebar. So again, I think it's it's a little bit of a longer term play, quite frankly. Uh, you know, for those of you on the call that don't know, the majority of vanadium um, is a byproduct. Very little of it is a pure play, if you will. So obviously, pure play equities probably deserve a little bit of a premium out there. But, you know, I still look at the vanadium market overall and its real drivers of demand as steel and as a steel story. Everyone's excited about vanadium redox batteries. And, and I think, you know, you should be, or at the very least, you should want to educate yourself about the vanadium redox uh, battery advantages relative to lithium ion, because they are pretty powerful. Um, you know, when you think about lithium ion with respect to energy storage, it's really, in my opinion, at least not the optimal solution. Uh, for grid-scale energy storage, vanadium redox makes so much more sense, okay? Um, and it has everything to do with just the life of the battery and also some unique financing mechanisms that are coming out around the leasing of the vanadium uh, as it's used in the batteries because it doesn't degrade in the same way that lithium does in lithium-ion batteries. So, you know, that's a really interesting thing that I'm spending a lot of time understanding, just the economics of the VRBs. Now, one of the challenges, so I think the final challenges with VRBs kind of becoming more mainstream has to do with the fact that the vanadium electrolyte uh, can be upwards of 30% of the cost of the overall battery. So it's enormously sensitive to the volatility of the vanadium price, which is a real challenge. Um, you know, you compare, you contrast that to lithium, where lithium is really only 5% of the cost of a given battery. And again, I know we're really, we're not totally comparing apples to orange, or we are comparing apples and oranges here, but nevertheless, uh, the price volatility of vanadium uh, is something you really don't wanna see. You don't wanna see these parabolic price spikes because it gets everybody excited, money floods into the space, the price mean reverts, and all of a sudden, uh, that capital is at risk of being destroyed. So. You know, again, longer term, VRBs make a lot more sense for certain storage applications relative to lithium ions. So I think you want to learn as much as you can about them and, and where they would be ideally placed. Um, but it's going to take a while before VRBs, I think, become any more than just a very small amount portion of uh, vanadium demand overall. Very good. 
So the greatest gains are perhaps made when investors take advantage of extreme volatility in the markets, especially when the price of an underlying commodity has weakened or softened, while the new demand story for that commodity is only just starting. Would you say this scenario reminds you of electric vehicles and battery storage as newer markets that the average investor has yet to take a serious look at? Yeah, I think, you know, that's a really interesting question. The technology that everyone is excited about today, vehicle electrification and batteries, you know, have been around for decades. I think the first, I think I may have this wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was either the first or the second Porsche that was produced back in the late 1800s was an electric vehicle. Okay, so, you know, this technology isn't new, but the technology has obviously uh i should say advanced or or increased uh during that time to the point where you know you have a number of regulatory and geopolitical forces really putting all of these technologies at the fore and so you know my sense is that when you think about the commodities or the metals complex overall um look i wouldn't want to be really anywhere else wouldn't want to be focusing anywhere else except for perhaps lithium cobalt uh, copper, maybe nickel, and of course, again, as I mentioned before, vanadium uh, probably deserves a little bit of a special mention. But my sense is that these energy metals are really going to drive interesting commodities going forward because they have implications in the commodity space as well as the technology space. So, you know, as an investor, whether or not you're an institutional guy or, or you know, an individual, I think obviously you want to understand basic uses, uh, fundamental supply and demand dynamics, but really, really understanding the technology, how these batteries work, how they're evolving. You know, we talked earlier about uh, the evolution of chemistries. That's going to continue. And so I think a really informed opinion on, on how all of these supply chains and these technologies are evolving is how you want to position yourself going forward. Because again, coming back to your original question, despite the fact that all of the lithium equities, cobalt equities, they've all been you know, punched in the mouth, for lack of a better phrase, uh, throughout the course of 2018. It's still an extremely compelling uh, place to be thinking about investing. Excellent. Well, as we start to wrap up the show, Chris, is there anything else you'd like to discuss today? Anything else on your mind? No, I really I feel like that last little diatribe of mine was was really it. I am very optimistic about, you know, the sort of the future of, of these commodities and technology and also kind of the geopolitical angles and how they converge over time to create opportunities. So I think learning as much as you can about each one of those aspects is is going to put you very well placed going forward. Very good. Some great advice there. Okay. Thank you very much, Chris. And we'll have you back on the show again very soon. Wonderful. Thank you. Think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people? Hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?